Hi, my name is Brent Bird, and I am a volunteer with the Business Advocacy Committee with the Campbell County Chamber of Commerce. And today I'm here with Robert Short, who is running for the office of United States Senator for Wyoming. And we thank you for coming on. And I wanted to ask you just a couple of questions. Certainly. Uh, first off, I wanted to ask you, what do you feel are the key responsibilities of this position? Oh, yeah. So the key responsibilities of a United States Senator. First and foremost, in my opinion, of course, is to listen to the words of the people they represent, to act on the desires and the wants of the constituency whom elect us to office. Secondly, obviously, uh, is to enact laws through the chamber that seek to help the United States of America, the citizens of our state, and obviously beyond that then judicial capacity and exercising oversight for the judicial branch, excuse me, the judicial branch, and of course the executive branch. Those are the fundamental uh, roles of the senator. Uh, obviously, beyond that, there's the engagement with the populace, engagement with folks from other parts of the nation so that we carry on a dialogue, and to set an example of civility and leadership across the country so that our country has some belief that our leaders actually can work together for the betterment of our people rather than for the betterment of themselves. Uh, so Robert, do you support the a fourth round of stimulus coronavirus relief funds? And if so, in what form would that look like? Yeah, that's really an interesting question, Brent. Um, so if you recollect, there's been three um, corona relief funding packages, so-called CARES Acts, as of this date. And in Wyoming, for example, we don't know yet how to actually allocate those dollars, which is a bit disconcerting. Uh, so the fundamental premise of the CARES Act was to infuse stimulus dollars into each of the economies of states so that we could kind of restart these economies that have been just absolutely hammered uh, by the ancillary effect of coronavirus. Uh, in Wyoming, of course, we're one of the few states that received the, the minimum amount, $1.25 billion. That's the minimum that was allocated. And we are one of those states that received that, I think North Dakota being another one. Uh, and we cannot yet figure out how to allocate those monies in a way that adheres to the really onerous rules that were applied by the uh, Congress to the distribution of those funds. So with that said, of course, it makes it extremely difficult to uh, jump up and down and say, yes, we need more funding, we need more funding. We don't even know how yet to spend the funding that we have. And our legislature has worked to try to create rule sets that allow for the distribution of those funds that actually help us. Uh, there are states, of course, that have had the ability to utilize all of the funding that's been allocated towards them. And, and I'm not necessarily sure that I want to um, advocate for more money for some of these states that have been fiscally irresponsible. Whereas Wyoming's done a great job. I mean, we are the most uh, solvent state in the union in so many regards fiscally. And yet we are under the biggest pressure associated with coronavirus because of the impacts that it has had on energy. Uh, but we can't use those monies for energy uh, we can use them for some infrastructure projects, and of course that's what I would advocate for, we, because Wyoming is in desperate need of some infrastructure upgrades and some expansions of our, our uh, traditional infrastructure. So at this juncture, it would be a hard sell for me to say, yep, let's just pour more money into our grandkids' debt fund mm -hmm. uh, and, and then just uh, uh, distribute those without any concern for what's going to happen in the future when the debt collectors come calling. So. Uh, I, I think given the right set of circumstances, I might support that, uh, but currently I would have to see you know, how are we going to utilize the funds that are out there available to us and what will we do with those in a manner that actually benefits the people of Wyoming. All right. Um, so Robert, how would you address the national debt and when will it be a concern and, and how would you address that? So when would I address, or how would, the first part was how would I address the so national debt? So yeah, how debt? would you address the national debt? With a shriek to begin with, ah! 
<laughs> you know, it continues uh, uh, exploding practically in front of us. Um, and, and that's been uh, exacerbated, obviously, by coronavirus, the, the seven trillion plus or minus dollars that have been allocated, roughly 20% of our GDP, 30% of our GDP, somewhere in that, that range. Holy cow, in a matter of a few months, we've spent that. That obviously is going to have massive impacts on our national debt. We have to be thinking very clearly about um, the people that we have representing us. Do they really understand the um, ledger, the balance ledger associated with, like any business person would know that you have income and you have expenses. If income is greater than expenses, then you find profitability somewhere in between. If income is much less than expenses, you have a deficit. And if you run that deficit very long, typically that business is sayonara, c'est la vie, a bientôt, we won't see you again, right? Uh, and our government seems to have lost sight of fiscal prudence, of understanding that you cannot constantly spend more than you bring in. That's, there's no business on the planet survives that way. And yet our uh, leaders seem to disregard that fundamental reality. So the national debt continues to balloon. So when am I concerned? I am concerned. I've been concerned for you know, a decade plus as we continue to see it ratcheting up. We have to have the courage and the uh, uh, intellect, the intelligence, to be able to address issues and policies that are fundamentally important to us and then start prioritizing and eliminating those that are wants versus needs, right? I mean, I'm sure it's the same for you at home, right? You have wants, you have needs. The needs always outweigh the wants. And it seems that we've just lost sight of that or turned a blind eye to it in our national dialogue. Uh, and of course, I think on the fundamental, you, myself, and regular citizens of this country uh, recognize and are emphatic that we must get this under control because it's not right to saddle your great-great-grandchildren with a debt that there's almost no possibility of paying back and thereby put us at um, a disadvantage against those outside actors who would like to leverage us vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, you know, financial incapacity. So I think it's really important for us to address that through prudent fiscal policy that does not allow for overspending, that says here's what we take in, our expenditures should not exceed what our revenues are. And if our expenditures exceed our revenues, then we have to reduce our expenditures. There's no question about it. We should never ever be in a position where we just constantly exceed revenues. There will be those ebbs and flows where you may actually spend more than your revenue but your revenue on the whole should always be equal to or greater than your expenditures. And in doing so, then you're solvent. And, and I don't understand why it's so difficult for our leaders to grasp that, but I suspect it's because very few, if any of them, have actually been business people like myself. Now, my wife and I run seven businesses that we've built from the ground up. And that's, a, that's an arduous undertaking at moments, uh, but we've been fiscally solvent since the day we started, and we continue to be that way. So it's, it's something I think I can bring to the table and hopefully speak rationally and civilly with folks around the country uh, to help them understand we have to do this for your sake and for the sake of your great-great-grandbabies. Um, Robert, I did want to finish with giving you one minute um, to talk about any passions or directions oh. that you wanted to, uh, to speak to. So I want to give you the platform for that and just take a minute to speak to that. Well, thank you, Brent, and thanks for uh, having me here. It's, it's a great privilege for me to be able to address the, the folks who uh, tune into GPA, and, and I appreciate your willingness to work with uh, the people of Wyoming and help them hear the voices of those folks who want to stand up for us. Uh, I'm Robert Short, and I am passionate about my state. This is where I grew up. I love this place with my whole heart, mind, and soul. I've been fortunate enough to travel to every state other than Rhode Island. I've worked in every state other than Rhode Island. I have traveled around the world. I speak multiple languages. Japanese, believe it or not, is my second language, which is kind of crazy for a boy from Wyoming, right? I mean, you go out talking to cows in Japanese, they only respond with moo, right? Uh, 
I think those experiences working with scientists from more than 100 countries uh, prove my ability to be able to interact with folks from different walks of life and different ethnicities and different socioeconomic backgrounds. I think that's incredibly important for us as we go forward as a nation to bring civility back into our national dialogue so that we can actually start addressing problems, so that we can work for the betterment of our country, to put our country back on a prosperous path and give every person the opportunity to live the American dream rather than continuing to create a disparity between the haves and the have less. So I'm Robert Short. If you want to find out more about me, please tune in to www.shortfor307.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Short for 307. I love my country and I love my state of Wyoming. It's the greatest state in the nation and I'm here to stand tall for it. Thank you. Thank you, Brent.